there's some sort of shenaniganing I have to do up here before we start. Lecture two. Fantastic. All right. Good evening. And thank you for that introduction, Omar. That was very sweet. And for the invitation uh, from both of you to present as a part of the interdisciplinary seminar at Cooper Union. It's important to know where we stand. And so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Leni Lenape upon whose traditional land we stand. Here I've chosen two images to represent leadership and elder wisdom with one image from the 19th century of Susie Elkhair and the second one showing Chief Dennis White Otter Coker at a protest from last fall. In knowing where we stand, it is also important to acknowledge that Cooper Union, when established, was one of the first free schools in the nation, free to men and women of the working class as well as to people of color in 1859. And here is Peter Cooper, whom we can thank for that, as we heard in Leslie's introduction, and for many other things, and for those of you who don't know, he invented Jell-O. Before I begin to wax lyrical about the history of Jell-O, I'd like to come back to the title of my talk, Decolonizing Archaeology. This is admittedly a broad and yet discipline-specific sort of title, which holds within it its own form of awkwardness, matched perhaps only by the awkwardness of moving between images of Susie Elkhair and Peter Cooper. And one could argue that in thanking or acknowledging both, in doing so, it stands in direct contradiction of each other. How can I thank the settler for being complicit in maintaining the land taken and building industry, even if it is included in illustrious schools such as this, providing space and lecterns at the Great Hall for native leaders, for early abolitionists, and for women? This space of free thought and free education and technical training was built upon a knowledge that this land was settled upon. It is precisely at the crux of this awkwardness, that we will occupy some space to help tease apart a more nuanced sensibility of what it might mean to decolonize archaeology, or for that matter, anything epistemically colonial. As you may imagine, I have a lot to say about this, but I will present just three salient points related to decolonizing archaeology in the limited time that we have. Now, it's important to keep in mind the contemporaneity of colonialism, and here the subtext is just thinking, you know, just, these are just quick notes, right? The deep relationship to capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. The impetus for decolonization, and here the subtext is contending with epistemic laziness. And then we're gonna think about decolonization as care, and here the subtext is love is political, slow down, and speculative futures. Now, all of this is gonna kind of show up throughout the course of the talk. And so I present these two as touchstones to keep in mind. And as we wander through my dissatisfaction with archaeological narratives constructed wittingly or unwittingly upon epistemic inequality leading to epistemic justice, I want you to keep thinking back to these points. The last 20 years of my career have focused on decolonization in a variety of ways, some of which I'll th talk through today. But discourses of decolonization have recently become something that people know about and are talking about. Now this comes with its own price and as a warning, which I will get to in a moment. So keep in mind there is a warning. <laughs> but for now as we start, it is very important to stress that the act of decolonization is not just about academic careers. It is about our bodies, our minds, our lives, our pasts, and our futures. The relationship and link between new late liberal or late capitalist models of racism and colonization are deep and complex. The racialized lives of people around the world today owe much of their condition to a history of colonization that links economics as capital to human bodies, landscapes, and forms of understanding self and other. Colonization was and continues to be an incredibly violent form of control that interlinks patriarchy, capitalism, and the project of nationalism. We don't really have to look too far to see Puerto Rico and what's happening now. Throughout my recent work, I investigate methods by which we as practitioners of a self-reflexive and critical archaeology can activate change within our discipline 
This metaphorical excavation of archaeology's disciplinary subjectivity is in the reality of the trenches, pottery yards, and cartography. And so decolonizing archaeology is not only an epistemic critique, but also importantly, a methodological reordering and reformulating. I find firm footing in this unsettled, anxious locus of contemporary archaeological practice, where there's a simultaneity of making and unmaking of theory and practice that is inherent and uncanny in our being archaeologists. One in which we excavate the earth in a destructive action in order to reconstruct the past in a constructive manner. In writing about community-based research, Halusa DeLay has rightly argued that social movements create new knowledge systems. It is precisely due to the dissatisfaction with archaeological praxis that many archaeologists today, some of whom are in the audience, are arguing for a practice of building new knowledge systems is in fact one that is steeped in a social movement. So it's not just disciplinary change, this is a social movement within our discipline. A movement in which we are directly speaking from and within the academy and demanding change. This is no longer a marginal movement. The question is how do we speak from within, recognizing that there continue to be forms of epistemic injustice in place that, for example, hold my knowledge my being, my words, in place. I recognize that inequity whenever I am overcompensated or undercompensated for my own work within specific contexts. And so I often claim to be speaking of and from elsewhere while remaining within. I also acknowledge that there is much methodological promiscuity involved in this endeavor at least from a traditional archaeological perspective. However, I find it necessary as I begin to realize that no matter what theory I used or developed through the bodies of knowledge that I did have access to, all ended up in some capacity, obfuscating possible meanings of things. I also believe in the value of thinking of that promiscuity as a move to create transversal dialogues rather than universalizing discourses, which is what archaeology has traditionally thought of doing. So for those of you who are not familiar with my work, but now familiar with my deep dissatisfaction, I will provide a quick version of what I've tried, and I'll come back to some of these with more detail related to these attempts. But for now, just to track some of my work quite quickly, um, and how I moved from method to epistemic critique to give you some sort of framework. Uh, my doctoral dissertation work conducted in 2000 to 2003. I, much to the chagrin of my advisor, isn't that always the case, insisted on decolonizing methodologies. I applied the post-colonial critique to past interpretations. I have worked with communities to dialogically entangle ourselves with the past and whatever sorts of questions we might have of our contemporary moment. And I have suggested that materials in traumatic contexts resist our constructions of meanings. But in each of these attempts, I continue to feel like something, not just anything, but something at one of the very first levels of assumptions was in fact problematic. There was something more that needed uncovering, and not just uncovering it, or at least attempting to do so, was in some capacity just lazy. Philosopher Jose Medina, in his 2013 book, Epistemologies of Resistance, explicitly outlined some of the problems with epistemic laziness. It's not really a problem in general if one chooses to be epistemically lazy. The issue only emerges if that same one chooses to do so and continue to create knowledge or use that knowledge without thinking through its baggage, so to speak. If you're choosing to take on the responsibility of creating systems of knowledge, then it is your ethical, if not moral, obligation, Medina argues, to think through epistemic laziness. Because otherwise, you are knowingly sustaining a system that privileges you over all others. There is not needing to know, he says, and there is needing not to know. Medina argues that this precise distinction categorizes liberal strategies with respect to racial and sexual difference within America, in particular when it comes to ideologies of colorblindness and gender blindness. These epistemically lazy positions are predicated on being actively and proudly ignorant of social positionality. I bring this up because I want to highlight the attention Medina draws to the social relationality of this interaction. And I want to bring it in conversation with the explicitly political dimension of the act of colonization. And the act of decolonization, sorry. 
Is it argument enough to claim that our ignorance of the unintended consequences of our actions is enough of a reason to continue to act without thinking through the systems within which we act? I'm gonna say this one more time, right? Because it's actually quite important. It's at the crux of what I'm trying to do here. Is it argument enough to claim that our ignorance of the unintended consequences of our action is enough of a reason to continue to act without thinking through the systems within which we act? I would argue no. It's just not enough. It is epistemically unjust the moment we participate in bodies of ignorance that we have inherited, which through that participation become active. Because one acts on it and fails to act against it, whether one knows it or not, and whether one wills it or not. And this is coming from epistemologies of resistance, and I agree with Medina in this case. Now, decolonization is a political act, not historical circumstance. As the title of Eve Tuck and uh, K. Wayne Yang's essay proclaims in the inaugural issue of the journal Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education, and Society, this is the title of their article, best title in the world, Decolonization is not a metaphor, straight up. This is crucial and so very important to understand. As a desire for justice swells by sectors of society that prior to this moment have demonstrated a certain tendency towards epistemic laziness, it behooves us to be guarded and clear about where and what the calls for justice are leading us to. These discussions related to social justice and decolonization as social and pol political movements can and probably should be located in places of collection, such as museums. The museum was a place I was raised in. I continue to work in museums, and as a professional, I continue to think about how curation happens. As an archeologist who specializes in the third millennium BCE, I have found that my work cannot be just or equitable if I do not contend with the museum. In fact, if I don't question the coloniality of the museum, my work will always be complicit with the colonizing mission of the museum. And here's a shameless plug for decolonize that place. Next Monday, um, if you choose to go to the American Museum of Natural History, there will be a tour that is led um, by Amin Hassan and others uh, for decolonizing the American Museum of Natural History. So, shameless plug, something worthwhile thinking about. And in that questioning, my archeological research becomes more contemporary, and this is one of the things that um, Omar was talking about. And this is something that actually I've, I've had conversations with the Rux Media Collective. And what they argue is that what makes this contemporary is the ability to step out of time to critically evaluate the past and the future, and that's precisely what contemporary archaeology does. And so what happens when you step out of time is that you enter into the space of stories and storytelling, which sometimes can be emancipatory, but can also um, be where stories condition your internalized schema of being. And you begin to realize that so much of how you learned to live in museums came from reading about how you were supposed to be. And to realize much of this and contend with my own self-colonial conditioning, I had to rely on the work of Fanon, Baldwin, and the vis visioning prowess of speculative fiction writer um, Octavia Butler. But we are not at the storytelling part of the paper yet. First, I have to tell you about my discipline. Archaeology can no longer feign ignorance. Archaeologists are fully aware of the imbricated and deeply colonial, racist, and sexist epistemology of our field. It is also commonly understood amongst archaeologists that without modernity, archaeology as we know it would not exist. But then again, insofar as modernity may claim history making through the construction of disciplines such as archaeology, it is also important to recognize that history is made for certain reasons. History, the deep past and or the contemporary, is molded and shaped in the service of the nation. Whether, whether it is there to contest it or promote it, in engaging with the nation, it continues to reiterate its power. Given that the project of modernity was linked to the making of history through archeology, span as the making of the nation, it is also just as important to recognize then the very complex and entangled relationships between coloniality, patriarchy, capitalism, and the project of modernity. Very simply put, coloniality and capitalism are ontologically constitutive of modernity, and thus so are archeology span and the nation. Artifacts have a long history of having been constructed through fetish, desire, and collection. 
The excitement or thrill of holding, touching, and possessing a relic or an artifact belies a desire to expand systems of control to encompass past times. The creation of colonial desire for the artifact links between coloniality and collections, as well as the manner in which the post-colonial nation has dealt with the artifact has been well documented in different post-colonial and settler colony contexts, and so I'm not gonna go over all of them here. But it's important to recognize that the artifact emerges as a desired object, not only in terms of collection, but following and arguably prompted by them as a primary object of archeological inquiry. This is what we work with. And so what happens then to the archeologist when the artifact itself becomes a vessel of colonization. It is the articulation of betrayal. What happens when those of us in the colonies grow up and realize that our childhood books are racist and bring to bear explicit expressions of coloniality. Deep in our childhood, these stories taught us how to behave and what is normalized based on an artifact of pleasure. And so this brings me to the impetus, impetus of decolonization, right? It wasn't just Pippi Longstockings, there's a little bit more. This is an image of me excavating in between two walls. This was my first season excavating, and I was a complete wreck because neither I nor the people I was working with from the village of Harappa could put aside our social and cultural understandings of one another. The issues of language were awkward because they could no longer joke about the rest of my team in the same manner because I was present. And my name and my clothing and almost everything about me, as one of the senior archeologists on the team said, as a joke, maybe, I think, all of this allows you to pass as native. The moment I picked up that trowel, everyone around me knew something was not quite as it should be. But every one of the elders from that team from the village of Harappa came and told me that this is how it ought to be. Now, given that the act of decolonization requires active steps to redress past injustices related to colonialism, it is also just as important to recognize oneself within that neo-colonial framework. So what I've done now is I've taken a bit from an older article of mine, Decolonizing Methodologies as Strategies of Practice. This is from 2006, because I kind of like sometimes going back to the older Uzma as she was full of wonder of like, wow, this is really important, right? So I kind of want to share that moment of wonder and discovery as I was writing um, this piece. Hopefully this will illustrate that moment of self-recognition within my own practice for you. During the summer of 2000, while working at Tel Aswehat, a third millennium BCE site on the east bank of the Euphrates in Syria, I would often stand on the top of the tell to understand wall alignments in the trenches. On one such day, I caught sight of my shadow cast on the side. I saw the form of a loose clothed individual leaning on its shovel. I was caught off guard by the image. It was an image of myself I had never imagined. Albert Memmi in The Colonizer and the Colonized opens up the section on does the colonial exist with the following, and I quote, we sometimes enjoy picturing the colonizer as a tall man, bronzed by the sun, wearing Wellington boots, proudly leaning on a shovel, as he rivets his gaze far away on the horizon on his land. When not engaged in battles against nature, we think of him as laboring selflessly for mankind, attending the sick, and spreading culture to the non-literate. In other words, his pose is one of a noble adventurer, a righteous pioneer. End quote. I'd always considered this description a somewhat apt portrait of most British colonial archaeologists. On that day, my elation that I might have reappropriated a colonial image, that there might be some reclamation of power, was literally overshadowed by the outline of my own form in the sand, becoming a metaphor for the colonial structures maintained in a neo colonial framework. I implicated myself and my unchallenging stance towards field methodology, realizing that conducting archaeology as an apolitical science was a luxury I could not afford. As Baba said, postcoloniality for its part is a salutary reminder of the persistent neo-colonial relations within the new world order and the multinational division of labor." End quote. This realization altered my subsequent field research in India and I required a new set of standards that took into account neo-colonial frameworks, 
while critically engaging with the context. And this included situating my practice at multiple scales, from global to local, simultaneously understanding interactions on individual le uh, levels based on class or caste, race, gender, and religious affiliation. And each of these variables within a larger context of how colonial history and the present simultaneously operate to influence decision-making, interpretation, and relevance for archaeological stakeholders. The location at which the presence absence of ancient artifacts was documented became a site of negotiation and interpretation of self and other. It is complicated to decolonize archaeology because of the deep and intimate relationships colonial states have to their archaeological sites and collections. These are monuments to nation building and authorized heritage. These relationships held by normative populations and governance are locally specific. However, what unites various geographies is the histories of colonization and the continued violence on othered bodies in those locales. These othered bodies are marked by racism and ethnicism. And this is the colonial difference that many scholars have argued was required for colonial power to be fully realized and for what, for what modernity was to base its existence upon. It's important to recognize that those racialized forms and bodies in a contemporary moment are a bit more complicated. So how do we locate that colonial difference in today's world? In my more contemporary archaeological practice in the United Arab Emirates, I'm often in an awkward position when asked why I haven't started digging yet. My colleagues look at me and say, you've been working in the UAE for four years. You haven't put in a single trench. They literally say this to me. And all I've been able to muster is that I'm exercising my right to refusal. I have argued and rationalized my way out of many colonial situations, but the high-income post-coloniality of the UAE is still under-theorized, and the implications of work and labor are even too heavy for me. Early in my affair with the UAE, and perhaps one of my favorite such moments, was at the third millennium BCE site of Tel Abraq, an archaeological site at the Emirate of Sharjah. The earth was excavated by men wearing shalvar kameez, speaking in various languages from South Asia. And as I walked through the site with my driver, they stopped their work to watch a woman wearing a shalvar kameez walk onto the site and discuss its antiquity with the project and field directors. I could hear them talking amongst themselves about who I was. My driver, who was born on that land when it was still part of the Trucial States, but holds a passport of Bangladesh, began to explain to them what I was doing. She's looking for people like us from a long time ago. And in the ensuing conversation, my research agenda of locating her up in sites in the UAE unfolded into the vernacular. Later, I asked the driver about the conversation and he said they all thought it would be amazing if you, an archeologist, can show the world that people from South Asia have been here for 5,000 years. I pointed out that culture changes and we cannot make a direct link between what may have happened 5,000 years ago and what's happening today. So well disciplined. Yes, he said, with a barely perceptible smile, but it would be great to know that we may have built that culture change on this land. I was silenced by the sliver of a smile. Later on that week, while driving along the east coast near Kalba, I stopped near some inland fishing areas and spoke to some men who looked like they were fishing. We spoke in vague Hindustani about the coastline and my desire to learn the landscape. As we talked, I lifted some of the earth from around us to get some sense of consistency between, fing between my fingers. This is what we do as archaeologists. We just kind of like go around and pick things up. Um, curious about the grain size, right? The men laughed after a bit and told me it would be difficult to get a sense of this mitti, this soil, this earth, this dust, because it was mixed from the construction sites. And in many cases, the beaches were being developed with earth coming in from different places. The coastline itself is constructed, as all landscapes inevitably are, but with sand from many different contexts. In its very essence, the materiality of its grains, this was a cosmopolitan coastline. My last question to them had to do with local fishing families, only to be met with the answer that most of the fishing families no longer lived in the area. I was left with a question hanging in the air of who they were but could not find the space to ask as if it suddenly felt incredibly personal, contingent, and unknowable. There was a silence that filled the spaces between us, and I turned to the earth once again looking for answers. I may never dig a hole in the UAE, because knowing of who that labor is, 
makes my complicity in a system I do not agree with all the more difficult to untangle. And so I find that such knowledge also inspires different kinds of acts of decolonization. Whenever bodies are mobilized across landscapes to maintain corporate and capital interests, which William uh, Dalrymple would argue is precisely the history of the, Indian, the East India Company, one needs to take a moment and take stock of what sorts of work archeological research is maintaining. As I've mentioned, I conceive of the process of decolonization as, destruct, as deconstructing systems of colonial power. That is to say, it can be a process by which the internal and systemic contradictions within archeological methodology stemming from a colonial history are made transparent and changed. So the transparency of this becomes very important to kind of un, to ex, excavate, right, to use that metaphor, to actually excavate the system so people can see where that kind of inequity, inequity lay. And as I've already argued uh, this evening, it is epistemically, epistemically unjust the moment we participate in bodies of ignorance that we have inherited. Archaeology's heritage is colonial, which impacts the manner in which it is practiced globally. It is deeply colonial on every level of knowledge construction around the world. It behooves us and those archaeologists in the audience who I see to think through that impact. Archaeology may argue that the construction of these knowledges was already in place, but through our participation, it is activated. Relying on old systems of power reflects the scarcity of time and energy required to negotiate and renegotiate our positions of power and privilege when we enter into people's lives and landscapes as researchers. And as such, these economies are symptomatic of complacency. Most decisions to maintain and reify power structures are not maliciously intended, but they are the byproducts of prioritizing research over inequality, disenfranchisement, and in a callous sense, of prioritizing our research practice over the present past or future of others. And so what might a decolonized methodology look like if one can co-curate and collaboratively produce knowledge with people? As I have mentioned, by the time I began my dissertation research in Rajasthan, I had become acutely aware that I required this new set of standards that took into account the neo-colonial frameworks while critically engaging with the context. Here's a map of the region. Now, now I'm taking you to India. And you can see um, right here, can you see? No, that won't show up. So the bottom right is, you can see India, you can see where the state of Rajasthan is in, in red, and here's a, a close-up version of the map. This is a map of the region where archeological survey was conducted, um, and more interestingly and more importantly, here are a lot of the people and places I worked with. Um, I may choose to identify in multiple, myself in multiple ways, but during my work between 2000 and 2003, others introduced me with certain qualifiers in a sequence I could not always control. Female, Muslim, American, South Asian, archeologist. Albeit formulaic, albeit, albeit uh, formulaic, once created without active intervention on my part, the repetition of that statement continued to establish my identity ascribing me to a very specific position within the village social structure. I worked mostly in village and rural environments in Rajasthan. I negotiated that identity by focusing on the performance of archeological research, including, but not limited to, my use of technological instruments, my attire, that in addition to a generic shalwar kameez dupatta, which is the traditional Indian Pakistani pants, shirt, and long scarf, for those of you who don't know, consisted of a large backpack and hiking boots. So I'd wear all that plus my backpack, hiking boots, and a GPS and all this other stuff. These interactions suggested two things. First, enacting archeological competence did not alter the social hierarchies in place. Just because I had all of that equipment with me and I could show that I was an archeologist or look like an archeologist, my look wasn't archeological enough for it to shift the social and political expectations of my body. And uh, secondly, that uh, somehow the performing of archeology span fits seamlessly within the combination of identities presented in a manner that was acceptable and believable. So it was kind of both things happening at the same time, that we believe you're an archeologist, and we believe you're coming here to do all these things, but you are still required to abide by all the cultural norms that are placed upon your body according to the rules and regulations of this village. My practice and performance were affected both by the rigid nature of the socio-cultural hierarchies prescribed by my cultural heritage and simultaneously flexible that uh, there was a certain flexibility that allowed for multiple combinations and negotiations of my identity. And I did use them in very different ways at different times. 
A key component to the methodology employed was, a community, was community participation and collaboration, which I have consequently considered to be alternating between community-based archaeology and public archaeology. A collaborative community-based model worked very well in a village-to-village -village survey. The preliminary survey work, as I mentioned, uh, took place in the summer of 2000, and in 2003, a full survey project commenced with, in total, 10 members, which included doctoral students from the University of Rajasthan, Jaipur, and the New School University in New York. In addition to these team members, smaller collaborative projects were formed with participating villages and communities in order to conduct the archaeological survey. And who you're, the people you're seeing here are many of um, the sort of groups, the community groups and the workshops that we uh, sort of pulled together. And this is at a police station down below, and I'm going to talk a bit about this in a second. I'll mention this in a second. These collaborative spaces were often realized through practices that documented the presence absence of ancient artifacts on the surface during survey. But this also include eight after school programs, 64 panchayat meetings, and countless discussions with individuals of all ages who would join us on our surveys. Communities who chose to engage in discussions about copper mining and publics that formed around the discourses of tourism, heritage management, and the use of archeology span in the contemporary world. Each new survey began with a visit to the village Sarpanj to discuss the overall project. I already had permits, all sort of like um, state officials knew what I was doing, but I thought it was very important to have sort of like a ground up political process in place as well. So we'd start with the visit to the village Sarpanj to discuss the overall project. This would often result in a discussion with other panchayat members and interested community leaders, including farmers. Such discussions made each of these individual stakeholders in the overall project. Each came with a particular point of view and specific interests in collaboration with the survey project. In most cases, local history teachers, my favorite, would also join in the efforts and discussion and their classes would join our surveys. In some instances, these students would actually become part of the after school programs in which the survey team would teach the students survey technique as well as lessons in the general archeology span of South Asia. Our work involved interacting with a range of persons, including officers from the Archaeological Survey of India, the State Government of Rajasthan, Secretary of Tourism, Art and Culture, the Director of Archaeology and Museum, the District Magistrate, the Assistant District Magistrate, the Sildars, Patwaris, police officers at the stations where artifacts were stored after a chance find, the Panchayat, individual Sarpanj, school teachers, as I mentioned, particularly history teachers, community leaders, elders, heads of households and farmstead, interested individuals passing by, and most of all, children. These methods were developed through our interactions with individuals and groups as an active mode of decolonization by incorporating community-based archaeology, public archaeology, and a change in the education and training of archaeologists, or what we would consider future archaeologists. These discussions and interactive spaces were crucial for the types of methodological interventions I had in mind. I felt it was important for the village and community to enable and empower us to conduct the survey, rather than our teams demanding their services. Already the fact that we had come to their village to understand the past shifted privilege to the archeological team. Having said that, by maintaining communication and really just hanging out with people, we were able to break some of our barriers of privilege, but not all. Our constant dialogue complicated each process. Invariably, our workday did not always reflect the plan that was established at the start of the day. This was difficult as it took control out of my hands as the director of a project and placed decision-making abilities into multiple hands, shaped by many other schedules, moods, ideas, which theoretically is the point of collaboration, right? interactive versus reactive, but it is actually difficult to operationalize practically and more specific to this kind of uh, audience, it is difficult to articulate as a methodological strategy, right? Because if it's constantly shifting and changing, you can't really put it up as a methodology, but that's precisely the significance of it. I realized, however, that by giving up control, the survey was open to experiencing and documenting the past in a way and in a manner that would not have been possible otherwise. One way to dismantle the colonial control of knowledge production was to give up that very control that continued to reiterate in my mind based on my own Western pedagogy. Working on archeological projects with community has proven to be an effective dismantling of research-based power structures. And many archeologists have developed um, these techniques over the last two decades in incredibly successful community-based projects. It's important to keep in mind that such methodology necessitates an active engagement with community concerns. <clears throat> 
In other words, simultaneous to the archaeological project is a development of heritage, identity, and in many cases, tourism. The management and public presentation of archaeological and other heritage resources created a situation in which heritage tourism might have been able to put money into the pockets of local communities rather than multinational corporations. And this would develop local heritage resources in a way that was sensitive to the needs and interests of the people. So a very kind of people and community-centric approach to tourism. And so this sensitivity, in terms of being sensitive to the needs of the interests of the people, brings me to my final point. And that is to think about how we might engage with politics of care. Or as uh, Alejandro Javier talks about it, a regime of care. And the way in which I like to think of decolonization as care. Self-recognition, knowledge, and reclamation are at the heart of how one might methodologically approach intersectionality and praxis, and this is really where care is paramount. In our contemporary moment, we've lost the ability to take time out to think, to write, to draw, to wonder, to let our curiosity dictate a research pattern. More and more, we are propelled into a system that requires all labor to produce at breakneck speed, especially if you're going up for tenure, people labor to produce at a breakneck speed, suggesting that somehow the survival of the fittest model of labor capitalism is achieved with the lack of all human needs, food, sleep, love, air, etc. The late capitalist model has alienated the human body to such a degree that we are no longer allowed to be human to be considered successful. One of the ways in which I consider decolonization to be useful is because it forces the hand of alienation to move. It actually removes the clutches of that form of control over self and control over body and labor. And in some measure, that is precisely what we want. But we have to be very careful because it is a privileged position. And I acknowledge that I am still working through how this might work for precarious populations. I'm quite aware of that. The reclaiming of a self that is mired in a late capitalist lifestyle is one that requires thoughtfulness, a sense of self-care, and a commitment to time as something to give, not to spend. A radical change in praxis does not always mean a dramatic and drastic change. Sometimes a self-awareness may result in a small material or spatial shift, but it is enough to create a balance. The dramatic quality of the change may be intangible, but palpable. In all of my experience, however, these modes of resistance have only ever worked through collaboration, finding allies in solidarity with others. It is through different kinds of practices and alignments that one can contest some of the conditions within which we are working. This can maintain one's livelihood and a sense of self, and so through these alliances and creating kins with others, and here I'm thinking both of human and non-human um, sort of agents, we maintain and protect ourselves, and ultimately that care for and with others is also self-care. A moment of irony, right? Cynical, the cynical is what comes in. What continues to be awkward, however, is that some sort of self-care is all over self social media now, right? It's all about loving yourself, self-care, don't, don't you know, hate on each other, especially if you're all in the, we're all in it together, whatever. <laughs> and so I, I want to contextualize this because I'm not just saying this as a like, self-care, love yourself, that's great, you should love yourself. But it must be contextualized, with, the significance of this care must be contextualized in relationship to some sort of, I'm still a social scientist, right? There has to be some sort of miracle data for me. And so in relationship to this project in India, so I'm gonna kind of wrap it back around to that project. One of the lessons of care involves the generosity of time. This is very important to me. In giving time, you honor people's time and their ways of being and understanding history and archeology span and specific to this, this specific case. Nothing exemplifies this more than learning how to visit people and drink tea. It is counterintuitive if you operate in a capitalist efficiency-driven mindset, but in fact has proven to be one of the most efficient and effective ways to work in most of the world. Drinking tea is both a metaphor and an action. It is about respecting the person sitting in front of you as a person first. It diffuses the instrumentalization of relationships that is so prevalent in a capitalist economy. And I would ex include contemporary knowledge production in this, the ways in which academics meet up for coffee. I'm sure artists do this as well. It sets up reciprocity, not to, not to throw you guys under the bus with us, but I figured why not. It sets up reciprocity, social networks, and in some, case, in some cases extended fictive academic research, artistic communities and kin. My experience in India attests to the protection, support, and access drinking tea has afforded. However, my experience also confirms that at each level of interaction, 
there is a coexistence of suspicion and curiosity as a traumatic remnant of a colonial past and a reiteration of an unequal present in which information, power, and prestige continue to be stolen from the caretakers of the land. It was only at the highest levels of Indian bureaucracy and within the company of internationally recognized senior scholars, usually with some Western training, that such a suspicion was not blatant and there was an expressed interest in my academic qualifications. At this privileged level, the individuals recognized, legitimized, and authorized some part, are some part of the elite on the national or international stage. In contrast, the vast majority of the middle class Indian bureaucracy showed less interest in my academic prowess. Rather, in order to gain access to locked cabinets, museum records, and information about previous excavations, I had to prove my trustworthiness by locating my spatial practice and performance within their social systems and cultural norms. During our survey, it became very clear that the power we carried was somewhat transferable. When we were invited to tea in a village household, the cultural capital of that household was impacted. A connection was made that often seemed to be very intimate on the part of the host and cautious on our part. Indeed, this may link to rules of hospitality, but perhaps more realistically, these levels of intimacy have to do with the ways in which power and privilege operate. Often our caution articulated a fear of not understanding complex village politics and the tacit knowledge that we as privileged archeologists coming in from the West could not give them everything our power might have suggested. Through our training, archeologists are transformed into vessels of power that signify promise, yet often cannot live up to that potential. It is the performance of power that we reenact by occupying a specific space that is not local to us, which recalls in the collective memory the colonial archaeologist and the power vested in their positions as embodiments of empire. I believe that a shift in methodology, one that accounts for a privileged practice, the collective memory of the colonial archaeologist, and the context for any curiosity and suspicion enables the archaeologists to dismantle the colonial structures upon which they stand. Most metrics of archaeological success do not have values implicit for community-based or decolonized work. In fact, it involves much time um, in workshops, meetings, and negotiating with a myriad of stakeholders invested in the project. Rather than not employing such a methodology, this simply means we now must reassess what a successful project looks like. Right? I'm not interested in changing that. I'm interested in actually transforming what success is. Not everyone is able, this is also very important, not everyone is able or equipped to do public and community-based work. I get it. I totally understand that. But everyone is equipped to ensure that whatever practice they employ does not reiterate colonial mandates in a neo-colonial context, maintaining certain power relations. I've come to realize that working with communities is actually good science ethical science. I have recognized the strength of my community in scientific research. My community interlocutors have pushed me to be more rigorous and to make me clearly understand the ethics of research in ensuring that communities have a say in the representation of material after we had conducted this survey. In academic speak, we might call this peer review. So there's no real way to come to a conclusion to such a presentation, right? It started with some awkwardness. I'm all about the awkward these days. It started with some awkwardness and then me kind of taking you through my dissatisfaction with the many ways epistemic injustice continues to manifest itself within archeological knowledge production. We move through understanding the impetus behind decolonization, specifically in relation to epistemic laziness. And we slowly meandered our ways through stories and accounts of practice of a decolonized methodology. But I will admit that the awkwardness of moving between the images of Susie Elkhorn and Peter Cooper have not diminished in this 45 minute time span. <laughs> Probably won't diminish in a while. And if anything, I'm more uncomfortable with this ability that we have to thank both. And that is how I suspect it should be in order for me to continue this sort of work. And in some sense, it is that discomfort I want to leave you with, but not just a discomfort. I would also like to end with gratitude to you for taking the time out to listen. Thank you. <laughs>